everyone. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started, and people can trickle in as they will. Um, I'm Brittany Segundo. I work with the MAP Board here at the National Academies, um, and along with my colleague, Katrina Hoyt, who works on the um, Atmospheric and Science, Atmospheric Sciences and Climate Board, we are co-chairs for the upcoming roundtable on artificial intelligence and climate change. Um, today's discussion will be moderated by Jesse Williams uh, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, but I'm going to take a few brief moments of your time to do some level setting um, about how the session came about and what we're hoping to accomplish with it. So today's session will be a town hall style, which means you don't have to listen to us talk, you get to talk. So it's going to be fun. Um, we're looking to identify how cross-sector partnerships and engagement can catalyze the application of artificial intelligence to climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, examine how cross-sector partnerships might be used to understand, identify, and limit the harmful applications and impacts of artificial intelligence on climate, and begin to develop key topics and areas of interest to be discussed at a National Academy's Roundtable on AI and Climate Change. So this is going to seed a lot of that discussion. So we're really looking forward to a virtual discussion today. But I want to give you some, round, uh, some background about what this roundtable is. OK. So this roundtable is going to foster ongoing discussions, shared learnings, and nimble coordination around emerging issues related to AI and climate change. It will explore both how AI can combat climate change and the environmental impacts of AI on the climate itself, encompassing technical, social, and behavioral dimensions. This was announced in Marsha McNutt's fireside chat um, this morning, if you've had a chance to attend that. So we are prepared to launch this activity sometime in the next few months. We are currently seeking nominations and suggestions for experts um, for the roundtable committee. So if you know of someone, if you are someone who would be interested in serving as a speaker, serving on the committee, just following what the round table is doing, please do go to this link and, and sign up and, and let us know. Um, oh, yes, sorry. Please take pictures. Um, and we also, Katrina and I also have business cards. Um, they don't let you make joint business cards with your work friends, but we did write your name on so you can contact either of us. Um, we are the place of contacts for this, so please reach out if you want to learn more about this effort. Um, okay, so this is building on a deep bench of work that the National Academies has been doing over um, the past few decades. And so one of our recent reports was the foundational research gaps and future directions for digital twins, and they talk a lot about digital twins from the context of climate science, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence to advance Earth system science, human AI teaming. We have done work in every division on this topic. So if this is something that's of interest to you, we can go to our website and read our reports. They are free um, and available for your download. So I just wanted to level set really quickly. Um, how many of you have heard of the National Academy's consensus study? Okay, and how many of you have heard of ground table? Okay, okay, so we've got some people who know what it is. Uh, well, typically, most of the people I meet are very familiar with our pieces of study, kind of our bread and butter, and they make recommendations, um, targeted recommendations for sponsors, things like that. A round table is a different, um, a different structure. The real deliverable there is the cross-sector dialogue, which is why this session today is so important for what we're trying to do. It's that dialogue between different communities that don't necessarily um, typically sit down and have a chat. So, um, so if you are interested, like I mentioned before, please reach out to Katrina or myself. If you are interested in getting involved, there are a number of ways to be involved with the roundtable. Um, there will be a nomination for members, and we will submit nominations for members. Um, there, it's possible to be a meeting or symposium speaker, and then every roundtable is going to have a lot of events that are open to the public. Um, and so that's an opportunity to both engage with the committee and participate in the discussion. So again, um, any number of ways to get involved. Um, I think the slide down a little bit. 
all thanks for that. But if you are interested in learning more about this, I know I said go to our website. You can also just come talk to us um, during the climate activity showcase reception. There will be multiple rooms with tables. If we're not in the one room, then we're in the other. So come find us, come talk to us. We'd love to tell you more about it. Um, and with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about hybrid meeting management. If you guys have been doing this all day, I know. Um, we do have an online audience. So we're going to ask um, everyone to raise their hands or to walk to the mic if you're in the room. And then online, please use the raise hands uh, feature um, and turn on your mic only when you're prepared to speak. Um, that would be really helpful. So without further ado, um, this again, this is a participatory session. Um, we want to hear from you. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Jesse, and thank you for being here today. Yeah. Right, it's pretty Am I good? Okay. Um, so, as as Brittany said, uh, this is going to be kind of a generative conversation where we're trying to brainstorm some of the, the ideas that come out of this, this round or some of the, the needs that this round is able to serve. So, we've set up a couple of questions to drive the conversation. Um, let me add a little bit of housekeeping. I know that we did some of that, but just briefly, I just want to note I am here as a representative of the NIST, as Brittany said. Uh, so, I am a federal gov government employee. Just want to note you shouldn't take my uh, entertaining or even floating <laughs> ideas here as necessarily uh, U.S. government positions on things. Uh, all again, the spirit of brainstorming and generative discussion. Um, and also, I think these conversations tend to be most useful if people are. Thinking about and responding to and building off on each other's ideas and suggestions, so please do uh, consider that um, as we're having the discussion. With that, let's just dive into the first question. Um, so, thinking about the many problems that need to be solved in climate change adaptation and mitigation, uh, which ones would benefit from AI based solutions that would involve the kind of uh, the kind of joint work between governments, private companies, and nonprofit organizations? That, uh, that the round table is ultimately hoping to catalyze and what's needed from each section. I know it's a very broad question, but I just want to see if anyone has an immediate reaction to that. If not, we can probe a little deeper. So, any, any thoughts on the broad question? Go ahead. Well, um, for, for us. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yes. Wait. I think it's your service. Is there a table next door? Or does the table look here? Here you go. Hi, I'm Kristen Jacobs. I uh, work for AC Foods. We're an ethical field investment firm out of California. Um, and so for us, this question, you know, I think I private companies. So uh, we try to look at our soil carbon stocks, our general, you know, scope one through three um, emissions of our agricultural you know, supply chain. And so what we're really working on right now is trying to figure out how do we use technology and AI to gather the most um, accurate and good quality data to report on our greenhouse gas emissions? And so what we're trying to do right now is build a technology software platform for our companies that can do just that. We're basically mine, we use many, many different technology platforms for all of our different farming companies. And so, you know, for water data, utility data, uh, fuel data, you know, it's all coming from a million different sources. And so we're trying to build an AI solution um, that can basically pull data from, you know, manual spreadsheets, you know, your typical Excel spreadsheets, paper, paper written, you know, invoices or, you know, whatever it may be and, you know, get that all into one dashboard. Um, so that's kind of where I see our need. I know you press you on that, Bruce. Thanks very much for the comment. Where do you see the needs for different sectors interacting? Can you just spell that out? Where do you see the convergence there between those sectors? Yeah, I mean, everywhere. I mean, I've been you know, talking to different people from many different sectors, and you know, you know the nature based solutions, you know, from I guess, you know, natural resources. We already work with a lot of natural resource um, companies and nonprofits, and so. You know, mixing, you know, and then mixing in the you know, academia and government, you know, the government sectors, uh, you know, to better understand our water policies and how all that, you know, all of those different sectors and all of our different needs. I do think, 
I don't know what it is yet. The AI is still so wild, wild west for us, but um, you know how that all gets wrapped up in AI. I, I think it definitely will have a uh, contribution, but I'm not really sure. So, so we're going back to the question. Are we yeah, that's true. Yes. Any other thoughts? It's too early to come to mind. Evaluating risk and cost in a, in a broad <clears throat> way. Whether you're an investor, what is the risk of certain investments with respect to the particular choice of the cash flow that's here for your investors? Buyers keeping that information, buyers in multiple sectors, the cost aspect. What is the cost of Okay, hi. Um, thank you. My name is Catherine Harrison. I work in public health and um, healthcare. And so, one thing that we are really struggling with, given just again, as others have said, 
the types of data, the disparate um, access, the the different, just um, how it's collected, where it's collected, and then a diverse landscape of healthcare services. It, you know, really varies um, by region or state or even local level, what's available. And to be able to have, um, you know, the ability to bring that together and lay out scenarios and modeling of health impacts. So for example, you know, on, on heat days, we talk about surge in healthcare facilities for extreme heat and heat illness, but we aren't also looking at um, asthma or diabetes or kidney uh, disease flare-ups also in relation to extreme heat. Everything is uh, pretty separated. Um, coming from different data sources, kind of um, single point to point. And so looking at that to one with the resilience of our healthcare systems and see what sort of planning um, and possibly even, you know, scenario planning based on surge and what we've seen in the past with pandemics um, of how we can, you know, what are some kind of optimal scenarios to prepare for that. And then at the public health level with communities, um, there's already a lot of talk out there on disaster resilience and planning, but climate change from a health perspective as a kind of a slow motion disaster on a daily basis, there are other health impacts to chronic illness um, uh, that that occur even with marginal changes uh, in the climate over over time. So having some ways, and I'm not sure exactly how AI could fit into this, but to, to be able to look at that and um, model, you know, resilience uh, strategies. Excellent, thank you. I'm already hearing one theme emerging, which is data, both as data sources across these different sectors, both as inputs for AI systems and as potentially ways that AI systems, some things that AI systems could produce will be informative um, to different sectors. More thoughts? I just want to leverage, um, Hilo Garcia, which is at the Office University, uh, I want to leverage in the gentleman, the lady, about data. I do a, a lot of analysis of GIS systems. And uh, so, as you know, the IPCC declared a piece of climate change to the extension of the facts, uh, vulnerabilities, and exposure. And then, the analysis that we are doing with GIS systems is totally visual, uh, because in order to find uh, with the plurality of, of these sectors, the social, economic, and environmental, um, is, is a very tiresome, it's a lot of time, it's something that AI can get me because it allows the data. And then the data is there, which we can tell you about the GIS, the data tons of data, GIS system maps, so socioeconomic aspects of how the population can grow and change. But unfortunately, if we cannot gather that information, it has to be. Um, Standardized and uh, related to uh, the population that will be affected is something that is affected directly on communities. So, definitely, I said data from that perspective for the GIS perspective. Another great example. Um, I also, I know we've heard a little bit about the slowly and clearly when people are going really fast, it's, a, it's harder to hear. Got it. Thank you. So enunciation today. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so I, uh, I'm a a program officer in the Division of Earth Studies um, and Academies. Uh, I think this is a great question to start the discussion off with. Um, particularly given the fact that, um, you know, 
these are obviously kind of like a, a, a really multi-sectoral problem. Um, and we're kind of recognizing um, the scale and the pace of the change that's needed to create these transformations uh, precisely at a moment when a set of technologies has come, has evolved, um, that allows us to act at scale. It's, it's a, um, but the problem is, is that the responsibilities differentiate it, right? So like the private sectors that have, the private sector entities that have the technical capacity um, don't necessarily have like the responsibility and authority of the public sectors are going to implement the techniques. And they're asking lots of questions. So if you talk to people at Microsoft or Google, um, they throw a lot of their own the technical resources to AI and ML and tech problems, but they have a hard time prioritizing like, where these efforts are going to be in the line of partnerships. So in answer to this question, I would say that um, if you talk to folks at Microsoft and Google and places like that, they would say that one of the major areas where AI and ML is kind of positioned to, um, to address specific problems is outside of the data and observation from the understanding space is process understanding. And while many of these systems that we're talking about are profoundly multi-sectoral, cross-cutting, um, and they are, they're structured in ways that are connected in ways that just make it really impossible for us to be able to um, manage them or, or understand them like when we manage them. So I would say that to the extent to which AI and all techniques can be brought to bear to help us understand really complex interactions and outcomes and kind of um, dynamic interactions and feedbacks across scales. I think it's uh, it's a great, a great example of a place where AI can play a role. Something else I heard in your answer was some division of, you framed that I think as, as what the different sectors, the challenges the different sectors face, but maybe flip it around. It sounds like one thing that, that uh, the government sector can bring is some of that prioritization, and some of the, what the private sector can bring is more of the technical on the ground experience and expertise. Was that a fair summary of that? More, more thoughts? Sure. I'll speak slowly. Um, probably one of the Texas players in the Institute is going to be proper. Um, following the comments, I think maybe step back and think about the uh, concept of this in the first place. Like, what well, we spend a lot of data together, all the stuff we do. We think about this communicating um, and common work and really um, set the stage for what we're trying to accomplish and understand the problem in the context. So that's going to help with communication and help with the data. Um, and I can help us conceptualize the problem, but I think most of us in this room understand that it's pervasive and really cuts across all sectors and interacts with all sectors. So, um, coming together with a common understanding about the problem space and the solution space um, in venues like this, I think that's really the place to start, too. Absolutely. And, uh, the expertise to do that, bringing together and define a common thinking model, which exists across all the sectors, I would imagine, should be part of all the sectors. Were there any other questions or suggestions online? Some questions. Just want to make sure we're not missing. There is an online suggestion can AI enable bridging the gap between federal funding programs and stakeholder community climate mitigation and adaptability needs. That is an interesting question, and I don't necessarily know the answer. I would welcome other comments from, from anyone participating. Um, I would also flip it around and ask uh, can the stakeholders involved in federal funding programs and stakeholder and community climate mitigation resilience adaptability needs kind of come together in a way that would benefit from AI, which is not necessarily a gift. AI doesn't benefit everything, um, but it's uh, you know, a piece of food for thought uh, for the round table. So, are we? Oh, yes, one more. Hi, I'm Nadia Center and I coordinate on the workforce and development climate projects. I think uh, two things jump to mind. Uh, one change is going to jeopardize a lot of jobs, um, and that begs the question of how much, of, how, what are we doing to help increase the systems that are teaching youth how to use AI solutions and tools, how accessible it is to them, how can it enable them to be able to obtain uh, jobs 
uh, is the power generating. And then the second thing is I think about how climate change is, is already affecting education. I think in particularly in several countries in Africa, including South Sudan, where school closures have reached two weeks this year, and which most likely these times are going to be more prolonged. We saw how within the COVID pandemic, technology was leveraged to the highest levels to be able to try as much as possible to um, sort of bridge the gap of not being able to learn in the classroom. Um, and so how can AI be able to, how AI-based solutions can be leveraged by multiple stakeholders in the education systems and always, always thinking about the digital divide and how can we include uh, those that don't have access to these technologies. Certainly, real need there to have. Oh, that's much better. There's certainly a real need there to have uh, representatives from across the different sectors to make sure that that happens. Um, I think, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next question. Um, so we've thought a little bit about the positive applications for AI in the climate space. Um, let's now think about the flip side of the potential negative impacts that AI R and D can have on climate. So what are some of the challenges that you see to having those, getting those, those impacts addressed? And again, thinking about the roles of different types of organizations, public sector, uh, private sector, and nonprofit, what are the different contributions that those sectors could make that could be brought together in a roundtable program? So we just start things off. Um, so one thing I hear a lot about is obviously the footprint of AI and kind of the burgeoning growth of the direct carbon emissions that are attributable. Um, I think if you talk again to like the technology folks, they would point out that um, you know the amount of energy that's used for AI um, in a given unit of time is actually pretty small right now, relative to kind of overall usage, like comparable to how much energy spent watching TV minutes across the country. But the problem is that obviously it's growing. Um, but the really interesting problem to me is that there are these there's direct footprint which is you know the, the energy that's used to run AI and train AI as well as the embodied carbon in kind of all of the infrastructure. But if you set that against the potential changes in emissions due to the ways in which AI will transform other sectors, then you're talking about potentially much, much larger kind of indirect effects. And that's not meant to be Pollyanna-ish, but it's kind of like a really important um, thing that's sometimes treated as an externality. It's potentially really powerful and an important thing for us to be able to get a grasp on. That's great. So, so let me let me dive into that a little bit for you or for anyone else. Um, where then? What are the challenges to actually doing something about that? And where can people from these different sectors? Contribute to, to starting to solve those problems. What are the why aren't we solving this energy usage problem or embodied energy problem already? That some of these sectors might be able to help us get past the barriers. Small question. I can throw out some, some buzzwords and see if people respond to them as potential uh, points of importance. There's measurement questions, there's regulation questions, there's uh, issues. Yeah, yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> I have not an answer, but a question, if that's okay. Um, so um, the question I have is that when there have been efforts to um, enable transparency on some of these computational impacts or hardware-related impacts, um, those efforts have often kind of leaned on voluntary reporting um, and not necessarily had sort of a steering or enforcement mechanism on the other side in order to potentially do something about that. So for those in the room, I mean, how do we get around that? Sort of what is maybe causing us to always go voluntary 
um, and who actually has the jurisdiction or levers to do something more real or concrete that makes the ecosystem really report on this. That's a very important question. I would, add another, I would add another question to that, which is given that uh, we're in a difficult regulatory environment right now, as I think we're all aware, um, how, how do we make it as easy as possible for the voluntary measures, voluntary reporting to be done so that we get the information that we need to mitigate? Because it sounds, I mean, implicit in the question there is that one of the key barriers, which perhaps could be solved by bringing these factors together, is that information about what in fact is the impact. Um, and so how do we potentially make the acquisition of that information easier um, by action from people across these sectors? I think it's a combination of uh, reward and punishment. So the reward for a private, uh, privately for the private sector publicly traded company is uh, the ESG rating. Get the increase in ESG rating and therefore get more um, investors. And um, then the punishment part is, well, I don't know what's going to happen uh, come November, but the new SEC requirement for publicly traded companies to report uh, not only not only on their environmental impact, but also on their, their climate mitigation plan as well. So I think um, you know, it has to be a combination of incentive and, and this incentive. I would imagine, does this take a second to draw? Okay. Uh, I would imagine then that to design those programs well is precisely something we would want all of these different players to do. Or you don't want the programs that are designed to be irrelevant or impracticable for the, the businesses that have to implement them, but you also want the governments that are policy levels. There was another hand back and just behind. This is maybe worth it's not working. I'll just be loud. Hi, I'm Amelia Demery, National Science Foundation. I think another key thing is about communication. Um, I feel that, you know, for different sectors, they have a target audience. And one key thing in AI is the data that goes in is going to inform the solutions. And how do we make sure that the audiences are all represented? Um, I think that there are key connections there to access, there's key connections to communication, education, literacy. But then I'm also thinking about earlier today when like what was it the quote the saying that like change goes at the pace of trust and so there is another factor here into data stewardship and how to foster that trust so that you have the data coming in that you really need to make those solutions so for example my expertise is in ocean policy when we think about the ocean observations we need to identify climate solutions to identify solutions that can be tailored to different communities that rely on the ocean. We have to think about the data that is actually going to reflect the, they're going to identify the solutions that will help those communities. And we know that it's not going to be the same across different regions. And when we think about those climate solutions at scale, so for example, marine carbon dioxide removal, those mistakes can have irreversible impacts. So I think a key thing when thinking about in incentives for different sectors is to identify what their audience actually is and be able to incentivize them to either broaden it, expand it, deepen it so that we can have a solution that really reflects the impacts that we see. Yeah, that was a great suggestion. And then again, to tie it, tie it back to this, this idea of bringing all these groups together, um, I could easily see sort of uh, getting, we're drawing in as many as possible of those perspectives, relying on having some people with connections based on their roles in the industry and some people based on the roles in government and so forth. So that might be, I don't know if this is in scope of the roundtable, but it's, it seems like you might need also to have uh, an expansion beyond the immediate participants in the network of 
bringing in representation from the networks of the people in the room, make sure that they're able to recruit and represent those perspectives. Hi, um, I'm Katani Carmesades. I'm at George Mason University and I'm a civil engineer. And I think one of the key challenges is infrastructure, right? Because given the nature of renewables, you can only have like maybe 23% of that energy that goes into the existing grid, right? So even if AI companies, you know, that, you know that, that's where the biggest number comes from, want to invest in renewables, we need to make the grid, you know, invest in the grid. So uh, you know, that investment actually goes into their net zero uh, kind of establishment because there is so much that the existing grid can take. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on the previous one. <laughs> um, so uh, my work is specializes in risk analysis of natural hazards and their climate change. And I think one of the key barriers that we, we have, um, I work in the integration of AI there, is who owns the data? Um, and do we have a common repository that we can go to and get that data from? Uh, there are a lot of problems that even if we have physics-based models, uh, we cannot validate, or a, you know, physics that we just don't understand, and AI can help us understand. So but to give a very you know, simple example, let's say my scale is uh, how you can use the root, right? It's such a complex problem that uh, a lot of the models that we can do right now have to rely on data, but the data gets lost in the process because when a hurricane happens, FEMA is on aid to you know, local governments and everything. Uh, they give that money to contractors to pick up the debris, but then the data oh, is owned by the contractors. So if they don't share that data with you, even though it's financed by FEMA, we, we cannot run our models, right? So. We are limited by the type of data and the quality of the data that we can get. Uh, and even if, of course, there are satellite imageries and other things like that, um, AI can help us to understand so much more if we could get access to that data, right? So I'm a researcher, if I could get access to that, um, that, that would be great. So I think those, you know, um, the challenge is let's make data more available and um, accessible to people so we can all contribute to solve the problem. Another great suggestion. And again, I think for first of all, you're, you're clearly bringing out this data theme even more. And I think the, um, I would see, and tell me if this is, is matches what you had in mind, I would see part of the role of bringing together people from these different groups as being about establishing common practices for how data is shared or can be shared and expectations of when it is or, or should be shared, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. yeah. um, and so there was, a, there was a comment on the Zoom about uh, at what point, at what emerging costs are non represented parties as far as equity? I didn't fully understand the comment. Um, so perhaps the commenter could, could either raise their hand or uh, Elaborate. Um, anyone else either in the room or online want to comment on the negative impact of the AI question? If there's any, Okay, so I'm going to. Yeah, I, I think one thing that feels like a, a very big challenge is that uh, when it comes to you know AI energy and hardware impacts, you know, we've talked about the fact that there are challenges, but fundamentally, we know that these things are in some ways quantifiable, um, that we can collect data about them. And when we talk about the impacts of AI applications that have a negative climate impact, like oil and gas acceleration or climate misinformation, it feels like the quantification problem gets a bit more difficult. People want to do impact assessment, but putting numbers on these things is hard, and you know, qualitative impact assessment isn't sort of as central to the way people talk about impact assessment. And then some of the levers also feel harder because if you're asking technology companies to not accelerate oil and gas exploration and extraction, you're basically needing to question their, their business models, which is a much bigger challenge than potentially kind of a technological peak. So that's something that feels to me like a big challenge. And I think why the AI conversation often gets, AI for climate conversation often gets framed as 
know, the AI can be used for climate applications and AI is bad because of its energy impacts, but this sort of AI is bad applications get sucked out because we, we may feel less hungry from what we do about it. And so I think the challenge is how do we make that more country and how do we take more, more tangible actions towards addressing business as usual AI applications. Important point that maybe was not, not featured uh, fully in the frame of the question, but it's also very worth thinking about. Uh, I think we do remember this time. I think a question on the line, which I think is referring to the global equity. You know, if, if AI is developed by a few US based companies, then anyone who's not in the specific companies might not be aligned with the intent of, being, of benefiting from the you know, for profit nature of the. The organizations that they're developed, or to the comment from the panel this morning, you know, some percentage or majority of code is in English or Chinese. What about all the other, you know, six thousand language groups that exist in the world, and how does you know the non-representation or non-inclusion of all of the people in the world and all portions of the world um, play into this? Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I think I, I misread the word codes because I. Working against and reading too much about standards. So I agree with the wrong place. Um, and I think that gets back to the point that was raised earlier about bringing in lots of representation via whoever's going to be participating in these conversations uh, through their networks and their knowledge. One more comment. Thank you. Um, related to that, I think it's also broader by the all stakeholders of transparency of the model. So that's an issue. Well, transparency of the model is an issue. No matter how it's applied. So um, if we can't trace back how these decisions are actually made by AI and what's included or not, that's a problem, I think. So um, having some pathways to go back to the original data resources, um, publish studies, whatever it is that they're drawing on, I think is important and that's getting harder to do. So across the different sectors, um, think about who's building these models and transparency that's Built in or not, I think it's important. Are you are you are you thinking about that as far as the negative or positive side here? Are you thinking about like negative impacts of AI? Do you say that? Or are you thinking back more toward the positive potential? Um, I think it's potential negative and a positive. Um, it's something that has to evolve. So if if there is not transparency, I can see a lot of people pushing back. Who's left out? Um, how are these uh, decisions being made about the data that's included? What are the conclusions based on? That's automatically an issue of equity as well as acceptance by the general public. Um, there's too much black box involved. And so that's potentially a negative. That's interesting because it, it, I think there's an interesting interaction between that comment and the previous one. Where you're, you're sort of expanding the scope of what we should think about as far as negative impacts on climate change. It's not the use of the AI system sort of directly having a, a negative climate impact through, for example, energy usage. It's more about the use of the system leaving people out in, in direct, this is a big the person online was getting, and also leaving people out and indirectly causing the solutions that emerge not to address all the needs that we have. Follow up on that. Also, have this statement. You know, following up on that, you could also have, and, and actually, there, there are people getting involved in the ESG area already on this, which is you know, certifying information. It, it, you talked about the black box function. I think that kind of reminds me of certified financial statements that you're going to have people review an AI model or AI report who are independent. And, and get involved in pursuant to a series of, of rules and opine on, yeah, you know, this is a fair and accurate statement of you know what this particular model represents in terms of greenhouse gas uh, emissions or savings. And you already start to see that people are getting involved, the financial services industry, bigger, you know, the big four already looking at this. And I, I think you're gonna start seeing more involvement. In in all these let me let me riff on that. I was going to say while you're passing the mic, but it takes just as long to turn off. Um, let me just riff on that for one second. The uh, the 
One thing that's kind of underneath that comment is a question about where the AI system is plugging in in terms of supporting work on climate or, or having impacts on climate. Um, and maybe part of the conversation to have here is, is uh, you know, where, where in this, like what kinds of decisions should even be made with the support of AI systems? Uh, where, where should they be plugging into those, those processes? Uh, question for uh, Pat. Sure, I just wanted to pick out uh, a thing that I think was emerging in the past couple minutes. <laughs> Digital divide and participatory process. Um, so, not so pleased that I'll start with the promise that I hope is there, which is you know, participation is very costly. And it's more costly for, you know, a sense, the more burdened people all are already. So I would look at um, sort of a, pro a promise of AI being a way of actually reducing the cost of uh, participating in different kinds of processes your voice being represented and having your voice count in various ways in different kinds of uh, a whole array of different kinds of climate related decision making. At the same time, I'm also concerned that uh, if it's too passive a form of participation, it won't matter. And in fact, it will not be real participation. It will be counted as the part of the process that actually does not uh, leave people who are affected feeling like they participate in this double edged sword potential. Absolutely. Um, so, now I think we, we uh, are about halfway through. So, maybe let's start taking some of these ideas and trying to translate them into something a little more concrete. Um, thinking about partnerships between these different sectors. Um, how could maybe what what could be the, the goals, the structure, the nature of potential partnerships between uh, governments, private sector, nonprofits, which includes of course academia, uh, to realize their potential to address some of the issues that we've discussed, solve some of those challenges, fill some of those gaps, um, and ideally in ways that balance out or not balance out, but that combine the uh, the strengths of the different sectors. What what might you create a partnership around um, to solve some of these? Thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed Itifad, I'm assistant professor at James Madison University. Um, I might not suggest like kind of uh, potential to kind of create some sort of magic solution to that, but I think a uh, few of the things I've been thinking uh, overall since this conversation has been started, uh, I think the whole conversation is more of a very neoliberal ideas like these technologies are going to solve the problem. And I think we thought the same about social media back in the days and then until very late we realized like oh no it's a hub of misinformation and conspiracy theories and like threat to democracy and like those kind of things and i think uh with the ai uh if you hear all the ceos of the tech companies people who are developing ais and they're competing against each other and making themselves or other people proud that we launching chat GPT 4.0 or like you know things like that. I think they probably haven't realized fully the potential or the consequences. Uh, they always promise it's gonna solve some sort of tech problem and we're gonna you know like from warming up our toast to climate change to health to education and kind of very flowery, a rosy promises and then media and everybody takes those hypes and then start kind of uh, framing that narrative, whole thing, until like kind of two decades later we realize like, oh, actually it has done more damage than it has promised to solve the problem. Uh, so I think from each sector, and this is also a very buzzword, creating partnerships, so you know, kind of cross sectors uh, partnership to come up with some sort of uh, potential solution to end the problem 
when we were not very transparent and open from the very beginning, that how is it going to solve or do more harm than good to that kind of technology or the cause they're talking about. That, that's one thing. I think if we just go a little bit back uh, in the history of technology development, it is very uh, obvious to see all those years they have promised good things to the general public. But at the end, it kind of looked at like kind of as a collective failure from public sector organizations, from academia, from the government, from these tech companies. And then we start questioning about ethics, transparency, openness, data, uh, all of those things, which uh, also to large extent, I think, uh, is coming from how they, meaning uh, technology companies, want us to frame or see as a potential when they don't have actual picture, which I believe because I, I heard recently a lot of CEOs uh, talking about the potential of AI, uh, just throwing a lot of big words when they don't even know what they're talking about. So I, I think it's very, uh, we, we as, as a civil society or a TV or organization fall into that trap. That yes, it's, it's amazing new technology, and we used to uh, kind of question more of technology acceptance model and things like that, like how people react to those. And now we automatically assume that people are going to fall into that, and they're already acceptance to a certain extent in the society, in the community, in the government. So I kind of very um, uh, kind of uh, think critically when they promise, uh, meaning a uh, day meaning technology companies promise us uh, as a society to solve certain kind of problems. And then until later we say like, oh, let's do a partnership and come up with some like read upon things. Everybody gets something, right? They, you have left enough carbon footprints. Again, that term coming from oil companies. So like all of these terms for hype, we, we, they create and we fall into that trap and then we start those discussions. So. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know where I'm going with that uh, comment. So overall, I'm like kind of very skeptical about the promises. Uh, not, don't want to throw any conspiracy theories or anything, but uh, very uh, you know concerned or you can say uh, critical about the promises we see in the media because often they only talk with these companies or the government. There's no community voices. There are no people who are looking at a critical way to study these technologies and how it's going to impact us as a society, as a country, as a region for issues we're talking about. Thank you. A lot of, a lot of great points there. Um, that, this connects back, of course, to the previous question about negative impacts, where perhaps a negative impact is just basically throwing a lot of resources at useless things or even you know, things that could be harmful in the end. Um, the, I, I want to make sure we're clear on the, the scope of potential partnerships here also. I think we're, we should, the, the point about, you know, technical solutions not always having the, the, the impacts that people want is a really important one. Um, and I think when we're thinking about possible partnerships, we should also think about not just partnerships for making technical solutions, but partnerships for programs that get implemented in society. People are often the hard part of, of figuring out solutions to these problems. So I think we, we should, to your point, we should really make sure that we're, we're keeping that full breadth and scope when we're thinking about potential partnerships. Um, just another thought about the framing uh, cross cycle cross cycle partnerships in this space is I don't know the answer, but I have a question about framing uh, it around AI is the right way to do it. And you know, I see what's already developed, and as I said, I'm not very well educated in this, but. Um, I already see it with many other technologies that there's not too much of a technology orientation to how people discuss things and not, and I see this very heterogeneous in its applications and probably in its, in its uh, constituent elements and characteristics. I would grab, I, as a question, I would think maybe it's better in the climate space to approach AI from the perspective of the problems and how uh, AI relates to the problems rather than starting with the technology, just as a proposition. Yeah, I, I think, 
I think that that's uh, so. I, we were trying to get to that a little bit with you know starting off with those questions about where are the problems that this would actually be an impactful approach for. Um, but certainly that's an important sort of consideration. Uh, I would leave it to the NAS folks uh, if they want to comment further on the, the kind of thinking behind the, the roundtable on this front, uh, as far as where where the process of thought uh, AI pops up as the uh, the go-to. Um, there was another. Uh, Yes. Okay. So um, my name is Kiana Shrestha. I'm a new national program leader at USDA BIFA. And one of the programs that I'm leading is called Data Science for Food and Agricultural Systems, BSFAS. Um, I would encourage everyone to take a look online um, at this program. Um, and the com my particular comment is personal, so I, I, I'm not representing my agency. Um, um, so I, I would say, what kind of cross-sector partnerships? So thinking, thinking beyond a company that has certain profit goals. Um, and I would, like if I have, an, if I use an example of maybe um, a particular technology that's related to agriculture uh, or farming. Um, or a group of people or, or an entity that, that's interested in employing uh, a small plot of land or a small farm to remove carbon or to more efficiently use their water to grow their crops more efficiently. Um, so there's, I mean, a, part, a cross sectoral partnership. Does not necessarily just have to be between a, you know the government or a company. It and I think we have to think bigger. Um, when a company thinks of okay, I'm going to develop an AI technology to address problems in this particular sector in agriculture. How how big are they thinking? Are they reaching out actively to these different groups, uh, stakeholders in this sector before they develop their technologies? Or are they just thinking, hey, I have this big idea, it's going to make a lot of money, um, it's going to save so much, I don't know, so uh, it's going to maybe remove so much carbon. Or, I mean, how? I, 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 it seems like we have so many silos where we're not thinking, uh, you know, wide enough to include all the stakeholders who, would, who should be using AI and data science to address particular issues. I would say, I mean, are we looking at the smallest of smallest farms, uh, the poorest of farmers, or are we looking at the poorest of people who might become farmers in the future? Are we looking at, are we talking to immigrants, new immigrants, maybe who are crossing the border who are going to become farmers, for instance? Are we talking to students who definitely who are interested in farming and who are also interested in AI and who are, you know, I mean, how? Who are who's in the room? Who's developing the technologies? Who's informing the technologies? And who's going to be, um, you know, if, you know, who's going to be the future of AI? So then, what I'm hearing in the room so far sounds like there's a, a fair amount of uh, reticence, I would say, about uh, some of the approaches that have been taken in the past to developing solutions that have this flavor. Um, I'm wondering whether that meta level of how off processes like this to work, how should solutions be developed, is a place where there is room for convened parties from these different groups to do some thinking or, or e either demonstrate or at least elaborate on what, what that process should look like. Um, just a bit of a provocation to think about whether that maybe that's the right level for the discussions that are envisioned here, that rather than Let's all go, you know, develop a solution together as part of this cross sectoral partnership. Maybe the partnership is let's demonstrate how you properly get all the right stakeholders in the room, or talk like come up with the the guidance on how to uh, get all the right stakeholders in the room to make sure that get the right uh, outcomes with respect to climate and yeah. other causes. That we'll come back. Hi, um, David Goldson um, from uh, Washington. So. I don't know if this is helpful. I mean, a couple of things, 
the question almost sounds like nothing is happening now, right? Where when actually the sectors are like inextricably tangled up all the time, right? In terms of where government funding is coming from, philanthropy, corporate, academic, um, sometimes other stakeholders. So it seems like um, you do have to take this sort of issue by issue, but it's not that there's sort of an option not to have cross-sectoral, it's sort of what, what kind, and including where the dangers in cross-sectoral where everybody's so entangled that there's sort of no objective outside thinking at all. Um, so, and I also think, I mean, back to some of the points that were made on the panel that I moderated this morning, I mean, some of these things are about, sort of not about AI and climate, they're about everything about AI everything about climate, right? And so, I mean, energy one is a, it's one of the few areas where there's like a specific intersection to work on, we think. But, so I think maybe one thing that can happen that, that really be, where the academy would be useful is what are the kinds of changes that AI is likely to foster, whether it's likely or not. Um, in where people live and how, and, and some of it's obviously going to be hopefully speculation based on something, but these are projections, right? In transportation, in all these other areas that, that Priya talked about this morning and, and some that we didn't even get to. Um, and how is AI likely to affect those arenas? And then what concerns did we already have about climate there and how can, you know, is AI going to exacerbate them, going to help them how to do that? But I think, I don't know, the more the conversation goes on, the, the harder it is to really think about these things in the abstract, I think, because it kind of inherently just turns into, this is a criticism of it, it's the inherent thing is that these, both these issues are kind of as big as the world, and then, you know, you combine them in a general way, you inherently just get mush or the status quo and that's what we're trying to figure out how to, how to avoid so i think it's really looking at the progress of each of them where they intersect and then diving in knowing that the sectors are already um hopelessly entwined thank you i heard i think two different ideas in there um one is the the need to kind of think a little bit more in specifics and go industry by industry or area by area when thinking about these. And then also a need to, um, to try to get beyond the, uh, the kind of uh, the very surface level discussions that often happen um, in this space and, and dig a little deeper. Um, any other, before we move on to the last question, any other thoughts on this one? I know that we've, we've had some sort of, again, meta level thoughts about the question itself and the, whether this is even the right framing. Anyone, some particular potential partnerships of, of interest? All right. Um, oh, yeah. That, I guess um, it's well, into the vein of partnerships, but how do we create um, kind of education and capacity building opportunities to allow these very, you know, like we're saying, the conversations need to have a very specific context, right? We have to dig in, that means there have to be enough people who have the baseline knowledge to dig in. Um, and so how do we establish some of these partnerships around AI literacy? In some sense, I think most people in society, for example, are not engineers, but if you ask somebody, is engineering well-suited as a solution to this problem, or like, do we need to bring an engineer into the room, then there's enough understanding of what that means to scope the answer to that question. And the same is true for various aspects of social science and such. But I don't think we're at that level of baseline literacy with AI, where it is even we have that kind of baseline mental model of is it the right tool? Like what is the risk? What is the, the reward? All of those things. And so um, I think I would be really 
curious, I would like previous comments also about just there's so much to do and so many things competing for our attention. Um, how to sort of enable that AI literacy in a way that you know makes sense given competing interests, time, attention, uh, but in a way that's productive for those distributed competitions to occur. Or education and uncommon understanding as another potential output. Um, the last question I wanted to pose um, is about pitfalls. So we've discussed this a little bit already um, about uh, partnerships being potentially not uh, not always productive. Um, but a lot of partnerships in this space seem to end up heading towards things that are really shorter term demonstrations or pilots um, and also potentially could be captured as we were earlier by uh, smaller, more, more myopic sets of interest rather than serving societal needs. So uh, it's going to be a little bit hard to discuss in the abstract to the previous points uh, without digging in a little more into what kinds of sectors we're talking about. Um, but any sort of high level thoughts on uh, where these discussions should, should think about uh, Designing partnerships to make sure they don't fall into those traps. What are the um, structural mechanisms that they might be able to use to make sure that the, uh, the partnerships go somewhere to, to the extent that we're, we're developing partnerships in this, in this way? Perhaps experience if there are examples that you can draw from that, uh, that make, make it more concrete. Is there a question? Uh, I'll just read out from the it's online embedding and making cross sector subject matter experts already built in trust nations communicating to peers over different sectors. Trusted village of elder or mayor participating in a mature relationship or a coalition to co develop conditions for culturally sensible, technologically feasible, needed communication solutions. And as an example here, offshore wind. So it sounds like the key recommendation here is to make sure that we have trusted channels between, between different sectors, with people from the different sectors already trust. And then we'll get some of the potential questions. So I, I don't know if you this is next, but just, I mean, one thing that's um, some extent has been brought out explicitly, I mean, we're talking in this on the corporate side, at least if we're talking about like, Base LLM models, which is the only player on this. But we're talking about, you know, this is, looks like it's going to be within the US and people, but literally a handful of companies. Right? So that's a different issue now. There may be a thousands, tens of thousands of companies building things off that base. But I, I mean, I think that has to, if that, does look like the way things are going, I think that has to be part of the conversation of all these um, questions, but certainly, in a way, it makes scalability easier, maybe, although the, the applications are going to um, companies. So that, that's one thing to think about, and I'm also a little nervous about, although I understand why we're all doing it, like just taking policy off the table, because to some degree, there is no way this can happen. Right? That policy can be pushing voluntary thing. I mean, voluntary situations happen usually when there's a backstop from policy. The backstop can be a threat, or sometimes it's an actual policy. But I, you know, I think at least as we're thinking of things, whoever believes, um, Having policy on the table, even if then people take it off the table, the fact that it's been there changes the rest of the way the conversation happens um, in terms of finding what the alternative incentives might be. Sometimes they're private in terms of spending. But um, so I don't know, that, that's just two thoughts that, that relate to this, but I don't think. I don't think we should start by taking off the table levers that have mattered in every other case. And, you know, I mean, you really have a weird situation where the AI digital stuff is like the last like, unregulated 
sector in America, in the world, and you have this perverse effect, partly because of the way it's up, because of the way the law is uncertain. We're getting a regulation just on liability and IP and everything else, where things that would naturally be regulated um, if they were done without AI, somehow AI is going to create inadvertently a free pass on things that have otherwise always been had, but for decades and sometimes centuries had some kind of societal control. So I just don't think we should start, even though the Republican platform actually says to get rid of the, the Biden executive order, even though most Republicans actually have that. Um, I don't think we should start by that. But then we, the reality can come in, um, but it shouldn't, shouldn't be from the yeah, great points. And I hope I didn't sound like I was trying to. I assume you're primarily thinking no, no, about no, regulation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's also worth thinking about you know, when we're talking about policy, even if regulation is, is hard, there are lots of things governments do as part of policy writ large that can also be part of that, part of that picture. Uh, and certainly, things, systems beyond LLMs should be not only in consideration, but in some cases, the main things. In consideration of that's really where the benefits have come from. Yeah, the long, the policy doesn't have to be about AI. It's about the tools for climate change. If that captures AI also, then that's fine. For those honest, the, the point was just the policy can be about things other than AI, but the things AI is trying to change. Please. Um, yeah, I, as I think about partnerships, one of, I think one of the opportunities may be around what are common needs and requirements. And um, again, I think. As you were just saying, I think lumping everything under AI is, a, is part, of what, part of what's making this conversation harder because some of these tools are accommodating different kinds of approaches. But I think, for example, I think we have, there's enough people who come together and said, we need explainable AI for it to be useful to us, that that has prompted and supported some of the kind of research that's going on around there and tools that are being designed around that. And I think. People who may come together around fitness for a purpose, and what that means that they have to stop and think about what that means to them and in their applications and what they're trying to accommodate and take advantage of, but also what their guardrails are. Um, that can be, might be a way of finding your useful partners who may not have been your immediate um, first thought if you were just trying to bring up partnerships in a traditional way. I see we are running close to time, I think. My reading, I can't see the clock perfectly. How much? Yeah. All right. So, if we're, are we actually? All right. So, we're going to cut it off there. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for all the great thoughts. Um, as mentioned earlier, written me in between our, our will be, will be uh, no, their, their emails were, I think, shared earlier or will be shared. I have a business card with my emails on That's your answer. Okay. So, for continuing the conversation, please feel free to reach out to them. Um, and I believe now we are moving back to the auditorium for the next piece of the plan.